checking in, but uh, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, again, just to uh, introduce myself very quickly and uh, make sure that uh, you know who I am and why we're here is, um, my name is Mike Shelton. I'm the training program coordinator at the Weeks Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, a federal state partnership between NOAA and the uh, Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Coastal Section, uh, part of Lands Division. And so what the, what the Coastal Training Program uh, does is uh, it works with partners. And, in, and today, uh, a longtime partner of my program is uh, the Baldwin County Soil and Water Conservation District, who uh, has helped immensely with the with programming over the last many years. And Laura Smith uh, uh, is also uh, part of, uh, of the Soil and Water Conservation District and invaluable uh, uh, part of this program as well as many other programs that I do. And so this is, a, this is, a, a th is number three of uh, a three short course uh, virtual series on, um, on erosion control and, and sediment management or erosion management and sediment control. One or the other seems like sometimes both erosion and sediment manage us as opposed to, uh, and control us as opposed to us, them. So um, uh, this is, uh, like I said, part of a series that has been in demand for uh, for years and we've trying to meet this demand and so that's where both Mike Perez and Barry Fagan come in and they're uh, going to lead this workshop and so um, many of you have been here before and I appreciate you coming back and uh, we're going to get started now and I'll turn it over to Barry. All right well thank you Mike and before you go too far um, I, for those of you who don't know Mike Shelton he's He's behind the scenes of a lot of good things going on there uh, along the coast. And uh, he, he seems to be, since, since the day I met him, seems to be a man on a mission, uh, not just to improve water quality in, in coastal areas, but also improve the way we do things so that water quality can be benefited in the future. And, and I just wanted to say, Mike, thank you for that, that commitment and the work. I, I, I know that it's way more than, than I see or others see, but uh, it is appreciated. And, and Mike, is, uh, he's not just a, a doer, he's also a collaborator who puts teams together and, and makes stuff happen. And that's, that's why Laura's involved and, and the other sponsors. And uh, so uh, on behalf of all of us, Mike, we, we do appreciate the work that you do. Um, and, and also everyone uh, who has joined us today, I, I appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, I was just looking over the attendee list and um, Tito, I, I appreciate you uh, breaking away from the boat and fishing rod long enough for uh, to, to join us on this workshop. But uh, I, I appreciate all of you, not just uh, investing in yourselves and, and, and improving the way you do uh, the way you manage stormwater, but uh, that does definitely help you, but it also helps us. It helps the state of Alabama. It helps, helps our, our waters, our lands, and, uh, and, and the way you do things also impacts the way others do things, even those that may not be on this, uh, attending this workshop. So, so know that your work does matter and it is being observed by, by others. So I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, I, again, I'm Barry Fagan. Uh, since you guys have, have been been with us now, uh, most of you for, for this being the third workshop, I'll, I'll save you with the introduction just to just remind you that I, I work for Volkert. I lead a, an environment and infrastructure group for Volkert, and we're environmental planners, environmental designers, and, and environmental permitting and compliance um, uh, professionals. And we, my group, helps to... Uh, facilitate development at the intersection of natural and built environments. And that's, that's right there. You guys are sitting there with us trying to, trying to make sure that we do things as we develop as, as a society and as, as our communities develop, that we're doing that in a way that, that has the, the least impact on the natural environment, sometimes uh, has the ability to benefit the natural environment. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and then let uh, Mike Perez, my partner, teaching partner, and, and friend kind of 
uh, introduce himself and get us kicked off. And I'll be right back with you in a second. Thanks, Barry. I'm excited to be joining you all again today for the third uh, presentation, third workshop. Um, we saved my favorite for last. This is uh, sediment basins, which uh, I got to work on my, uh, my, my PhD work revolved around investigating the performance of sediment basins. So um, it's a subject that I, I really enjoy talking about and sharing photos and sharing uh, ideas and, and resources. And uh, we've also been very involved with IECA. Uh, Earl and Perry sit on the committee and we recently developed a standard, a new standard for uh, sediment basins. And, we're trying to share the knowledge uh, with the, the national and even international community on the best approaches for designing, installing, and maintaining sediment basins. So you'll get to see some of that here today. Um, I did put a couple of links on the chat. Uh, as a reminder, slides are available for download. Uh, you can see the link here on the screen. It's also in the chat box. And if you haven't already jumped on Pull EV, go ahead and do so. I provided a link for you. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started here with our first warm-up question. And you should be seeing it on your screen. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, you can select as many responses as, as you'd like, uh, but we just wanna gauge how you are professionally connected to the stormwater community here in Alabama and outside, maybe uh, from a national standpoint. I'm seeing a lot of uh, responses for others, for other areas. If, if you wouldn't mind sharing, I'd be curious to see what organizations or what communities you're a part of. Um, you know, maybe type in the chat box, uh, what organizations have been helpful for you uh, in connecting with stormwater professionals and, and in developing as um, uh, in your career as a stormwater professional. So uh, for today's workshop, we've got three primary learning objectives. One, we're going to be able to, we're going to, after the workshop, you'll be able to explain the function and role of sediment basins within a comprehensive stormwater management plan. You'll be able to describe the state of practice for sediment basin design and the selection of various components. And then you'll be able to apply, learn principles and processes to design a sediment basin for maximum effectiveness on a job site. All right, so here's our second poll question. We wanted to get a, a feel for how often sediment basins are being used on your construction sites. Are these tools that you're using for every single job? Do you see them on most projects, uh, maybe 50-50, or are you rarely seeing them on your job site? Looks like we've got a a good mix. We've got folks who never see them and folks who use them just about in every project. Um, and I'd say that from what I've seen kind of in, at the national level, Alabama does tend to rely on sediment basins and rely on temporary detention uh, quite a bit more than other states do, especially the states that have less rainfall. So good. So we're going to start off uh, by discussing the function, the role, and the purpose of sediment basins and how they fit into our, uh, our stormwater management plan. And Barry will take us off and mind us why we're, we're doing this in the first place. Yeah, so with, with each of these workshops, we've, we've uh, I, I guess, addressed right up front how, this, how the particular topic of the day fits into a, a bigger picture and, and a bigger, bigger plan, I guess. Uh, well, as, as our uh, objective state, as a, a part of a comprehensive plan for managing construction stormwater. And, and so with, with each workshop, we've uh, talked about the, the why way before we got into the, the what and the how of, of managing construction stormwater related to this, uh, this particular topic. And, and so uh, we, we've highlighted the potential impacts to our lands, to our waters, to uh, to ourselves as we, we try to keep ourselves running in compliance with, with regulatory requirements. Uh, we, we were reminded that soil, soil is a natural resource, as are those, those upland areas that might be impacted by our, our work. Our, our waters are certainly natural resources, and those, 
those contain not only species, but also habitat that could be impacted by our work. Uh, we were we talked about the Clean Water Act and how the, the, the act is almost 50 years old now. And, and while a lot of good has been uh, done because of the Clean Water Act, it still hasn't fully met its, its purpose of, of maintaining and restoring the, the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. And we've fallen way short of meeting the goals of the Clean Water Act. And those were uh, to eliminate pollutants to our waters by 1985 and to restore all of our waters to a condition that met their designated uses. And sometimes we refer to that as fishable and swimmable by 1983. And, you know, just some, some examples here in Alabama, we have over 3,300 miles of rivers and streams that, that are impaired. Uh, we've got nearly 230,000 acres of, of lakes and reservoirs that do not meet their designated uses. Uh, speaking directly to, to you guys in coastal Alabama, almost 430 square miles of bays and estuaries are classified as being impaired also. And, and so that's, that's about 95% of the bays and estuaries that have been assessed uh, are, are too polluted to support whatever we've designated their use to be. And that may be to support fish and wildlife. It may be to support a, a fishing industry. It may be to support recreation, uh, but, but that's a lot of, lot of water that's impaired. And of course, not all of those impairments are, are directly related to uh, construction stormwater management, but, but many of those are. Sediment and siltation, that's our, our number one impairment of rivers and streams. Uh, we talked about phosphorus the other day when we were, we were talking about uh, fertilizer and, and producing vegetation, establishing vegetation. Well, phosphorus is, is responsible for the majority of the impairments in our lakes and reservoirs. Um, the greatest cause of impairments in bays and estuaries, that, that comes from bacteria and pathogens. And a, a pretty prevalent source of, of those nutrients or, uh, is urban runoff through our storm sewers. And, and so it, it may, may not be construction stormwater, it may not be post-construction stormwater, but, but stormwater in general is a big part of, of the impairments of our state's waters and, and our nation's waters. And so we as stormwater professionals have a pretty big responsibility and, and role um, to, to fill there as we, as we meet those, the purpose and the goals of the Clean Water Act. We also talked about the laws in Alabama and, and our, our new general permit that addresses uh, runoff and discharges related to construction activities. And, and we walked through um, the, the permit just as, you know, when we, we talked about vegetation management, we went through some of the permit requirements. Same with those uh, three practices of inlet protection, construction uh, exits and sediment barriers last time. And, and so I'll share with you a couple of, a, a few excerpts related to uh, sediment basins. And so uh, right off the bat in the, the listing of types of prohibited discharges, the general permit specifically prohib prohibits discharges from sediment basins unless that sediment basin, uh, unless that discharge is, is withdrawn from the basin from the surface. We'll, we'll talk a little more about that. The, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dig, dig into that a little bit more later. Uh, this section at the bottom, it states that sediment basins should be installed and, and stabilized prior to construction uh, and uh, or commencing other construction activities. And then it goes on to require uh, that sediment basins be located outside of any water of the state. Remember, as, as we're trying to protect waters from sediment, it doesn't make any sense and it's not, not very effective to try to capture sediment inside of those waters. You know, even, even best management practices that are intended to, to, to go in water, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to rely solely on a floating turbidity curtain, for example, um, because that sediment is in the water. It's, you can't get it back out once it's, once it's in there. So, so no sediment basins in a water of the state uh, design those to store at least 3,600 cubic feet uh, per acre of, of area drained, uh, utilize outlet structures that withdraw from the surface, utilize erosion controls and velocity dissipation 
at the inlet of the sediment basin and at the outlet of the set sediment basin, and then remove uh, accumulated sediment to maintain uh, at least one half of the capacity of, of that basin. We'll, we'll talk, we'll cover all four of those, those items uh, as we go through the workshop today. Um, the, the general permit points to the Alabama handbook or, or the blue book as we'll, we'll refer to it also, uh, and also mentions designing to, to maximize the removal of sediment resulting from a two year, 24 hour storm unless otherwise specified by the blue book. And I, I think you, you're probably hearing some conflict there. Is it 3,600 cubic feet per acre or is it the, the two year 24 hour storm? Well, Mike Perez, uh, I think he's gonna get into uh, those differences as we get into to sediment basin design here in just a little, little while. Uh, there's also some specific uh, mitigation and reporting requirements if we have, uh, problems associated with our sediment basin. So if a, if a dam fails, we've got 24 hours after our inspection to construct a temporary containment system or put in a permanent fix within five days. If we can't meet those deadlines, we have to, we've got to talk to ADEM and, and, and see where to go from there. Um, also just in general, discharges from pavement wash waters and those waters that might contain residue from chemical treatment uh, uh, practices like flocculants and coagulants, those can't be sent directly to a receiving water. They have to run through some sort of sediment containment of, uh, practice, such as a, a sediment basin before those are released. And this, uh, just a reminder, we went over this, this definition the last time, but the BMP or best management practice, just keep in mind that practice covers a lot of, lot of different things. Uh, we're, we're talking about implementation and maintenance and structural and non-structural and, and management strategies. All of those are considered practices that, that should be a part of your construction best management practices plan. Uh, and then also remember that uh, that term best in there, uh, what, what that, the face of, of best management practices that changes over time, or it should, if we're doing our job of getting better every day and working toward the goals of the Clean Water Act, then what's best today may not be the best in 10, 10 years or five years or as technology develops. And as we learn, we get better. And so then the, the better practice then becomes, becomes best. And uh, so, so keep that in mind as we're, we're trying to uh, get better at what we're doing. And, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, some, some advancements in sediment basin technology today. And, and we'll, we'll show you kind of what's, what's required and, and what the minimum is, but we'll also talk about some enhancements you can make to those basins. So if you've got the best as what's in the, in the permit or the minimum requirements, and then Mike Perez and I tell you something that would enhance the effectiveness of your basin, well, now you've got a new best management practice. And I, I think while it might not be uh, required by regulation, I think we have an obligation as a professional to, uh, to, to implement best management practices. So we've talked a lot about the, uh, the, the five pillars of construction stormwater management over this workshop series. And, and, and that's a, that's a part of developing a, a comprehensive construction stormwater management plan is we're not just thinking about managing sediment and we're not just thinking about preventing erosion. We also have to think about those other three pillars of managing communication and managing work and managing water so that our, our efforts uh, at, at maintaining or preventing erosion and, and, and uh, managing sediment, those can become more effective. Um, as we do that. So I'm not going to go over those again. I hope that, that uh, we've, we've made our point there that communication is the most effective practice we have available. It's, it's also the least expensive. And then, uh, you know, as we're, we're sharing the priorities and expectations for our contractors, we have to remember that they are capable and, and willing if we tell them up front and we're willing to pay uh, for whatever it is we're asking, they can do it. And, and so we have to manage their work. We manage the water, which creates the erosion, which contributes to the amount of sediment we have to uh, have to deal with down at the bottom of the slope. So um, 
just a, a reminder that there's a, a, a summary of those five pillars in the, um, on the website that Laura sent you a, a link to this morning and all the reminders about these workshops. There's a link to that website. There's a, uh, so at that website, there are slides from, from all three workshops. There's a summary of the five pillars. And then we've also added an article that uh, talks about um, unexpected outcomes from sediment basins. And it provides a pretty good synopsis of what the state of practice is for sediment basin design and construction is today, if you wanna check those out. All right, so really digging into the, the function and the role of, of the sediment basin, really one primary function of, of sediment basins, and that is uh, that's to keep sediment on your on your construction site. It's to uh, the as as runoff runs across and and from your your disturbed areas of disturbed soil, it's going to carry suspended sediment with it, and the the role of the sediment basin is to to minimize the, the amount of, of sediment that's transported. That, set, that suspended sediment is it's trying to leave your job and the, and the uh, sediment basin is trying to, to hang on to it. And uh, while, while a sediment basin or any excavated hole in the ground will, will help to remove the heavy particles from that runoff, turbidity is something that uh, it's a challenge in the state of Alabama. We talked about the a red dirt uh, over over these workshops and, and turbidity is is a challenge and a sediment basin is really the 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 best available practice we have to to try to polish up that turbidity uh, before it leaves our site and so if our sediment basin is full of heavy sediment it's going to be really difficult to to manage tur manage turbidity within the same practice and so we'll we'll talk more about um Decre decreasing the amount of heavy sediment as we go along. So uh, there are some other benefits uh, that sediment basins may provide. In, in addition to turbidity polishing, I mentioned capturing heavy particles. Uh, they can also serve as temporary storage uh, of, of runoff and, and, and serve as detention. So to slow the release of that runoff. Um, and, and really what they're doing in, in very basic terms is a sediment basin creates a place for fast water but to become slow water. And we talked, uh, I think back in the vegetation management workshop, we talked about the benefits of slowing water and the dangers of, of allowing water to, to speed up. And so we can reduce the water's erosive energy. We can re reduce the size of the particle that's being transported we can also reduce the the mass of sediment that's trying to be that is uh that is being carried by that runoff just by simply slowing the water down and so with a sediment basin you got this pool of water fast water hits slow water and and those sediment particles they start to try start to fall out and that's uh, really a process of gravity just pulling those soil particles down toward the bottom of the basin there are forces that keep those particles suspended and we, we try to overcome those forces uh, within the basin and uh, Mike will share with us some of those elements that, that helps with that and, and part of that is simply reducing the turbulence within the basin and, and turbulence is just uh, you know water going every which way and, and so we put these baffles out there to to calm that water to get it to a state where where there aren't as many forces pushing the particles upward that uh, the majority of the forces are pulling, uh, pulling downward. So we create this long flow path with calm water. Uh, this, this flow path is, is longer than it is, is wide and we hang onto that water as, as long as we can. And then once we're ready to discharge that water, we withdraw it from the surface. And, and while we can't, uh, can't always get to perfectly clean and clear water, uh, our, our job is to reduce the amount of sediment that, that's trying to leave our projects. And, and sediment basins can give you an 80% 80, 80 plus uh, reduction in sediment load, even if you've got some turbidity leaving your water. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we, as we go along. So, uh, and then uh, obviously we can add flocculants and coagulants to, uh, to, to our sediment basins and to the treatment system to try to help with uh, with that turbidity to try to polish it up a little bit further. So that's a, 
in, in really basic terms, the, the function and role of the sediment basin within that comprehensive design plan. And uh, so Mike, take it away with some design principles. Thanks, Barry. And uh, we've got another poll question for you here. For those of you who are involved in the process of designing sediment basins, or if you're managing a sediment basin on a job site, in your opinion, are basins being designed and, and installed correctly, or is there room for, for improvement? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the responses. Um, I'm not seeing anybody saying that they're always installed. And so it seems like, and I, I see the same thing every time I see the sediment base on a construction site, I always find something that could be improved. There's always a tweak that could be done to make sure uh, we enhance the way it's been installed and, and being implemented. So as we go through the various design resources or the design uh, uh, aspects of a sediment basin, I, I do want to remind you that the Alabama Handbook or the Blue Book has uh, resources available for the proper design and installation and maintenance of the sediment basin. And there's actually, there's a good design uh, principle or design example in there to walk you through a step-by-step -step on how to properly size a basin and where to place it. Um, there's a, several different components that make up a sediment basin system. And so uh, in the diagram here, you see you've got a section called the forebay. And this is the, the area that leads into the basin. This is made up of a, a channel that's used to collect all the stormwater and convey it into the inlet of the basin. And then you also have the basin itself or the settling pond portion of the sediment basin system. And within that basin, we split it up into various bays. We, we split it up using uh, porous baffles. And then you'll see in the back face of that sediment basin of that pond, you've got your primary outlet, which would be a surface dewatering mechanism. And then you've got your auxiliary spillway to allow for excessive flow to, to bypass the basin if you do have a condition where the basin is, is full. And so we'll get into each one of these various components as we get into the, uh, the, the workshop here. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight some of the key features of the basin. And so here's a, a photograph. This is from a job site down in Mobile, um, Highway 98. Uh, you can see this basin highlights some of the main features that are, are part of the basin system. And so you've got a stabilized inflow channel. Uh, you've got a series of baffles within the basin. Uh, that are used to still or to calm that water, to spread that water across the effective width of the basin. Uh, your primary outlet is the skimmer that's floating in the back and it's got sitting on a nice pad to keep it out of the mud. Um, and then your spillway is just off that photo uh, where water can bypass the basin or flow through the basin if it, if it becomes full. Um, you know, one other thing to point out with this basin is that it's, it's stable. Uh, you see you've got vegetation established throughout the sidewalls. Um, you've got a geotextile line on the floor. And so when water comes into the basin, uh, the basin itself doesn't become a source of sediment. You're not causing erosion along the floor of the basin. Your sidewalls aren't sloughing in. And so that really helps uh, the basin perform and to help polish that stormwater before it leaves the site. The basin storage is split up into a variety of different zones as well. And so uh, down at the basin or at the floor of the basin, we have our standing pool. That's a permanent pool of water that can only infiltrate or evaporate. Uh, you then have the stormwater storage, which is your design volume for the basin. Above that, you have your auxiliary spillway flow. That's a design flow rate that will be going through the spillway. And then we have a safety factor or a free board that we add on top of that to prevent water um, breaching over the sidewalls or over the embankment of the, of the basin. Uh, one important thing to point out in this diagram is that the placement of your outlet, your skimmer, uh, dictates the separation between that standing pool and the stormwater storage. Uh, I'll show you some examples uh, later on here where uh, the placement of that outlet wasn't well thought out and it really impacts the amount of stormwater you're able to store and detain. And so if we get into each one of those various storage zones, uh, the idea with the standing pool is uh, that's a, a permanent volume of water that's going to stand in the basin. It's not going to flow through the skimmer. And what that allows you to do is to capture that first flush that tends to have the highest turbidity, highest amount of, of pollutants, and to detain it for an extended period of time. 
It also serves to, to slow water down as it's coming into the basin. Uh, having that permanent pool, uh, research has shown that uh, it helps reduce the velocity within the basin, helps uh, calm that water down and distill it and reduce resuspension of material that's already been collected on the floor of the basin. Uh, the stormwater storage, that's the volume that you've designed for. So it's either the 3,600 cubic feet per acre uh, sizing guidance, or if you go with a two-year, 24-hour design storm, that's where you would fit it in. Your auxiliary spillway flow, typically we're designing for higher flow rates through the spillway. We want to make sure we can have a, uh, a stabilized mechanism to let higher flow rates uh, exit the basin in a controlled fashion. So we'll stabilize the spillway with either riprap or uh, vegetation or other means and uh, make sure it can convey uh, here in Alabama the 10 year, 24 hour storm event. And then uh, the freeboard, uh, like I mentioned, that's just additional storage uh, to allow uh, for some safety or allow that uh, water to be contained within the basin and not breach over the banks. So another example of how those different storage zones could apply to a sediment basin, you'll see where the, um, the skimmer is connected, the primary outlet, that creates a separation between the standing pool and the stormwater storage. So the skimmer is not able to dewater below that pipe as water, water is not gonna flow uphill. Um, so the placement of that becomes important. Um, above that, you have your stormwater storage. And in this case, uh, this particular sediment basin was going to be used as a permanent detention feature on the job site uh, post-construction. And so the, um, the spillway or the uh, weir on the opening on top of that outlet control structure, that's serving as the auxiliary spillway in this uh, example. Uh, and then anything above that is your freeboard. And in this particular case, you know, you would also want to put uh, an additional spillway or additional low spot on the, the back face of the sediment basin. Uh, to allow water to, to flow through in case that, um, that outlet control structure becomes overwhelmed or clogged up and, and water can't flow through it. This diagram here shows you the basic function of the uh, baffles and the skimmer. Um, the idea is as water comes into the basin, uh, it starts to fill up, uh, but the majority of the velocity is contained uh, to that first bay. That first bay tends to collect the most amount of sediment uh, that's where velocity is really choked down, um, and, and you're also trying to reduce your resuspension and contain it all within that first bay. And then as you get further towards the back of the basin, uh, you're slowing that water down every time it goes through another baffle. Uh, and then eventually when it's going through the skimmer, uh, you know, you're dewatering from the top, which would have the, the least turbid or the clearest water, uh, and then slowly dewatering down to the back to your standing pool within the basin. So this is an example of a, a basin that has a majority of the components installed. You'll see the inlet um, coming into the basin that's been stabilized. Uh, you've got your baffles separating the basin into the various zones. A geotextile is protecting the channel for the, the basin from erosion. Uh, your skimmer is installed at the outlet control structure and then the top of that outlet control structure is serving as your spillway. Uh, there's some room for improvement here. Uh, like I mentioned, most basins always have something that can be done to improve. Uh, you can extend those uh, baffles and connect them a little better to the, the sidewalls of the basin to prevent any water from bypassing or, or short-circuiting around the baffles. Uh, but one thing I, I really wanted to highlight here is how important it is to stabilize the basin so that it doesn't become a source of erosion. So let's get into the various features of the basin, and we'll start with the sizing and the dissipation of energy within the basin. And when it comes to, to sizing and placing and locating your basin, uh, there's a few items to, to keep in mind. Uh, this comes from the Alabama Handbook. Uh, but when selecting the sediment basin site, we wanna make sure that you're placing it downstream of your construction site. Uh, think about the treatment train or the other practices that are treating stormwater before it reaches the basin. And you wanna to try to capture the largest soil particles outside of the basin so that the basin serves more to polish the stormwater rather than capture to capture the larger soil particles. Um, it's important to divert your clean water, your sediment-free water away from the basin. Uh, so if you, there's an area on the job site that maybe already has the parking lot, it's already stable, maybe the, the infrastructure is already in place. 
uh, it's a good idea to try to divert that storm water away from the basin so that you're not having to treat additional volume. That also helps you reduce the size of your sediment basin if you can divert off-site water or any clean water that might be flowing to that low spot. Um, it's preferred if you can construct the sediment basin uh, by building a dam across a natural swale uh, rather than excavating uh, down into uh, native ground. One thing to keep in mind is that the Army Corps restricts us on the height of those dams. We can't go any higher than 10 feet. Uh, before you need a permit or you need a review by the Army Corps. So uh, the handbook or the blue book requires you to stay below 10 foot on dams. You want to think about the placement of the basin so that if there is a sudden failure or there is a breach in your embankment, uh, it doesn't cause loss of life or any serious property damage or flooding to neighboring um, structures. You also cannot place sediment basins within intermittent or uh, perennial streams. You want to minimize the interference with other construction activities. So consider the various phases of construction, your initial grading, your intermediate phasing, and your final phase, so that when you place your sediment basin on your plant set, uh, you're not conflicting with grading operations or with perhaps a, a structure or another element of the construction project that might be in its way. Think about maintenance. You want to provide access for the clean out and for disposal of any sediment that has to be removed from the basin. And think about where you're going to take that sediment. Are you, are you moving that off site? Are you going to uh, have a spoil pile somewhere on site where you can manage that material? Uh, and you know, again, keep in mind that the majority of the sediment is going to accumulate in that first bay. So you want to make sure you have access to that first bay where an excavator or a dozer or a skid steer can get in and out rather easily. When it comes to sizing uh, the basin, um, We've learned through research that the size and the shape of the basin affect its ability to trap uh, sediment. And so we'll talk about some of the optimum uh, configurations that are, are being used. At a minimum, you should size the basin to store 3,600 cubic feet for every acre that's draining into the basin. And so 3,600 cubic feet, that uh, relates to about an inch of runoff. So we want to store the first inch of runoff for every acre that drains in. Uh, the EPA permit also tells us that we could design up to the two-year, 24-hour storm event if we wanted to do that. Uh, but here in Alabama, that does result in a much larger basin. And I'll highlight what a big difference that does make if we want to go with that design guide. Uh, at a maximum, the drainage area to a basin shouldn't exceed 10 acres. We want our length to width ratio to be at least 2 to 1. And then we want to limit our side slopes so that we don't exceed 2 to 1. And then the depth of the basin should be at least two feet. So you can see here on the, the banks of the basin of the pond itself, um, we want those side slopes to be no, no steeper than two to one. And then the length to width ratio, that should be measured from the top of the basin. Uh, if you were to measure from the bottom of the basin, it actually ends up being, um, if, if you were to determine your two to one ratio from the bottom of the basin, when you get to the top, it would actually be less than two to one. Uh, it's just the way the geometry works out. You, you do the math with the, the banks and, and it throws off your numbers. So um, as a general rule, you know, design the, your length of width from the, the top of the basin. Uh, something else to, to point out here is uh, that we haven't talked about, you know, when your skimmer comes to rest, you want to have a dewatering pad or a surface dewatering pad for that skimmer to sit on and keep it from getting stuck in the mud. And like we said, the, the volume we're designing for is that stormwater storage segment of the basin. Now, the Alabama permit tells us that uh, we're required to design erosion and sediment control practices for site-specific conditions, and we need to install and maintain them to minimize discharge from storm events up to and including the two-year, 24-hour storm event. And so if we look at the two-year, 24-hour storm event across the state of Alabama, you see that down in uh, Mobile and Baldwin counties, we've got about six inches of rainfall. That's our design storm event. And then when we get to the northeast portion of the state, uh, the lowest rainfall, the lowest two-year 24-hour rainfall we have is about 3.8. And so if, you're, if you are designing a basin for site-specific conditions, uh, you need to consider your local rainfall, your local soil hydrology, uh, so that you can appropriately size that basin. And a good resource is uh, TR55. You can use the equations in TR55 to determine the appropriate volume sizing factor. 
And that volume sizing factor, that's that 3,600 cubic feet per acre, or you can go in and calculate an appropriate volume sizing factor based on your design storm event and based on your soil hydrologic, soil group, and curve number. And so to give you a visual representation of what this looks like, uh, here on the x-axis, you have rainfall in inches. On the y-axis, you've got your volume sizing factor. That's cubic feet of storage for every acre. And then the lines going across the page, those uh, the red, green, blue, and, and orange, those are your soil, um, your, your curve numbers, your, uh, based on the hydrologic soil group. So these numbers are for developing urban areas, newly graded areas. Um, and so if you have an A hydrologic soil group, you've got a curve number of 77, which that would represent a high amount of infiltration, low amount of runoff. And then the other extreme end is a hydrologic soil group of D, which would be more of a clay soil uh, that doesn't have a lot of infiltration that tends to have more runoff. And you can see if we plug in that 3,600 cubic feet per acre on the bottom left corner, that tells us that we can, we can capture up to about 2.8 inches of runoff on an A soil, on a, on a sandy soil. And then on the extreme end, on the lower end, that's only about a one and a half inch storm event uh, on a D soil. But if we plug into the same chart, the rainfall that we can expect in the state of Alabama that range from 3.8 to six, you can see that we really should be designing if we wanna match the two year 24 hour storm for a volume sizing factor anywhere between 6,000 and 19,000 cubic feet per acre. Um, so realize that if you do do a two year 24 hour storm event design, it's gonna be a significantly larger sediment basin uh, than if you were to use the 3,600 cubic feet per acre size and guidance. Uh, another important element that's part of the sediment basin system is your inflow channel. Uh, the idea with the inflow channel is to convey water in a controlled fashion into the basin. Uh, it's important for this channel to be stabilized. It could be either a permanent stabilization or a temporary stabilization. Uh, you want to include uh, check dams or ditch checks throughout that channel and slow that velocity down. Uh, you consider adding an excavated sump that serves as a forebay. And that allows you to collect additional sediment or have additional storage uh, within that channel section. The whole goal with the channel is to capture your large, rapidly settable solids before they enter the basin. And so what this allows you to do is in that excavated sump area uh, in this four base section is to have an area that's easier to access for maintenance. Uh, this would be, you would access it, more, access it more frequently, remove that sediment more frequently, uh, and really allow the basin to serve as a, a, a polishing tool, really focus on turbidity more than uh, sediment capture. And we've seen through research that having this four bay uh, section upstream really helps reduce the total amount of loading that that sediment uh, basin receives. Uh, this is a video showing you a time lapse of that uh, four bay and how it would serve. Uh, you can see that it has uh, a small amount of detention uh, that allows you to capture those, that first flush, those heavier soil particles. Uh, and then as water overtops through that check dam, in this case, it's a, a rip raptors check. Um, you know, you're, you're reducing at a lower velocity or you're, you're discharging at a lower velocity and hopefully you've caught some of those larger particles. Um, it's important though that maintenance uh, be done in this area before, um, or maintenance be done in the inflow channel uh, to reduce, you know, resuspension of collected material. And, and so you do want to remove that as it starts to accumulate. When it comes to the, the overall shape of the basin, uh, there's been some models that have been created uh, to look at various geometries that we could use uh, for a basin. And so if we look at a traditional, just a rectangular basin uh, with water coming in uh, on one end and, and leaving the other end, we get about a 30% sediment capture. And if we start uh, creating longer flow paths, so in, in example G here, we've created a, a kind of a, a labyrinth where water has to flow through uh, these various uh, segments to create a longer path, we can get a much uh, greater capture rate at about 76% of what came in. And then we start looking at dissipating, dissipating the energy. So in you know, example E, you spread the flow across the entire width of that basin. You know, something like what a baffle would achieve. Now you're, you're again at 76% of, uh, of capture efficiency. 
Uh, we can look at making the basin very uh, narrow, making it long and creating a long flow path in this manner. And here you're getting 90% effectiveness. And so some of this early research that was done has helped us kind of think about the various geometries. And this is why you end up seeing a two to one length to width ratio. We realize that if you make the basin longer, um, that helps capture sediment and it helps reduce velocity. Um, if we spread the flow across the width of the basin, again, we can reduce that velocity, reduce resuspension. And so that's all to our, to our benefit. So the Coyer baffles are used uh, to slow that water down as it comes in. We want to install these baffles perpendicular to the direction of flow uh, and throughout um, the various segments from the inflow to our discharge point. Um, this is to, to increase deposition. We wanna increase the, um, or, or decrease the velocity as it's coming through the basin, increase the effective width uh, spreading the flow out allows us to use the full cross section of the basin, uh, reduces that turbulence, and then shortens the time of set for sediment to be captured. This is a video I've borrowed from Dr. McLaughlin at NC State, uh, but on the top, you see the effect of having a, um, a baffle, and on the bottom, you've got the same flume without a baffle. And so the water has been dyed with this green pigment to show you the effect that that baffle has. Uh, but you can see it, it greatly reduces the velocity and you can even see that it's maintaining that plume down towards the bottom of the, of the flume. The effect of various baffle types has also been investigated. And so this was a study done at NC State uh, where they looked at a variety of baffle materials. And so, um, they had a basin that was open without any baffles. They had a, a baffle material made out of silt fence. Um, they had one made out of uh, a tree protection netting, which is similar to construction netting, the orange type of plastic fencing you might see around uh, a job site. And then the last one they looked at was coconut coir or jute uh, coir baffle. Um, and you can see here on the, the median grain size, so the measurement was the, the diameter of the soil particles captured. Um, so on the input, that's what was coming into the basin. And so you can see uh, you went from uh, 134 to 108 micrometers without any baffle in place. But if you did have a silk fence baffle, you got down to 74 micrometers. The tree protection got you down to 58. And the highest uh, performing was the coconut quarter uh, material, which got you down from 134 down to 45. So this is why we recommend uh, using the coconut quarter baffles Here's another great photo showing you how those baffles are acting to spread that flow out across the entire width of the basin. And so that dye really helps us visualize uh, that effect. And so the handbook tells us that we need two layers of coconut coir baffles. One is placed on the front face of the baffle and the other is on the back face. We should be using material that's got between 700 and 900 grams or per square meter. Um, like I said, it helps distribute the flow across the entire width, um, increases the flow length, helps dissipate the energy, reduces turbulence. And uh, at a minimum, we want three baffles uh, to create four bays within the basin. Here at Auburn, we were looking at the effect of that first baffle. So we realized that the first bay is the most important in order to, for us to be able to reduce velocity and to reduce um, the energy as water is coming through. And you can see on the top, we've got the standard first baffle. So that's a, a layer of baffle material on the front and on the back. And on the bottom, we've got what we call the modified. And so that was double the amount of quarter material. So basically four layers of quarter uh, before water gets to the second bay. Um, and so pay attention to the amount of uh, turbulence you see in that second bay. And you'll see that, I'll try to replay the video here, uh, but you'll see that in the modified baffle, that bottom uh, video, there's a little bit less turbulence on the surface of that second bay than you see on the first bay up top. Uh, and so that just shows you how that baffle is used to, to really slow down that water uh, and still that water before it, it gets into that second bay. When it comes to installing the baffles, uh, it's important that they be installed correctly so that we get the full benefit from the system. We'll use uh, silt fence materials, uh, T-posts, and wire backing in order to hold the baffle material up. 
You also want to have support across the top. Um, I like to see wire being used, but you can also use rope. That helps prevent sagging on the uh, quarter material. You want to make sure that you secure the baffle uh, appropriately to the bottom, to the floor of the basin, to the side walls, so that you don't have flow going underneath or around the sides of the baffle. And you also want to make sure that the baffles are high enough so that water flows through them even when you have spillway flow out through the auxiliary spillway. Uh, you want to secure the baffle to the sides and to the floor using staples or stakes. You can trench the coconut quarter down um, and, and secure even on the horizontal side on the side walls of the basin. And like I mentioned, you want the full height of the baffles to be above the depth of the basin, including the spillway flow so that uh, you get water, you get treatment as water is flowing even through the spillway. And by treatment, I mean you're slowing down the velocity even as water is bypassing through the spillway. Uh, the, the blue book has a nice detail on how to install uh, your, your baffles. Uh, I'll remind you that you want to use one and a quarter pound um, per foot steel T-posts. These are more, more rigid than the, um, than the lower weight T-posts, and it does make a big difference for the stability of the system. Uh, you would tie your wire or your rope along the top, add your wire backing, your wire fence, and then your coconut quarter on both sides. You want a coconut quarter on the front side and on the back side of the system. And so here's an example where uh, those, uh, the, the coconut quarter is not up high enough. You've got a low spot along the center line of that basin. And then it's also not properly secured to the side walls of the basin. So you're ending up with a lot of bypass um, around those coconut quarters and really it's not working as effectively as it could. Next, let's talk about dewatering and our spillways. So from a dewatering standpoint, we know that we need to dewater our basin from the top of the water column. That allows us to, to, to remove water that's been treated. You know, you have the, your cleanest water up at the surface as your sediment particles are settling down. Um, and so that's a, the most desirable portion of the basin to be removing water from. So we generally re rely on surface skimmers uh, which uh, they're pretty reliable. They can be maintenance free in most cases, uh, but occasionally you may have to go in and remove any debris uh, from the orifice that might be clogging up the skimmer. From a dewatering time, uh, the blue book tells us we want to target anywhere from two to five days. We also want to make sure we're installing the skimmer in the fourth bay, in the back of the basin, so that we can maximize the flow path as water's going into that um, Basin system. You can also consider adding a valve, a shutoff valve at the outlet of the, of the skimmer so that you can completely close off flow if you wanted to control or, or detain that water for an extended period of time. And so there's a variety of surface skimmers that are out in the market. Um, you, you may have seen these various looking. Uh, skimmers on your job sites, but they all serve the same purpose, do watering from the top of the water column uh, at a controlled rate. And so it's important that when you're designing your skimmer that you select, um, that you use manufacturer guidance for flow rates so you can properly determine your discharge rates. And so with this particular model that we're showing, uh, this has an orifice uh, that you could change out to, to really get that flow rate targeted uh, to, your, to your desired design rate. And so uh, to point out here on your, on your skimmer, on your primary, primary outlet, you'll see that we've added an option in the back for that shutoff valve. And that's where you would want to locate it, somewhere where you can easily access that shutoff uh, if you did want to contain that water in the basin for a longer period of time. And so this could be a simple, uh, PVC ball valve, I've seen gate valves, um, inexpensive to, to install and, um, and basically maintenance free. When it comes to connecting to permanent structures, uh, you can see that this is a good example of us uh, using a, a, just drilling or pouring a, a hole through that concrete outlet structure. This is just gonna be a, an area inlet, uh, but we can, um, we can install a skimmer 
excavate an area and use it as a temporary sediment basin um, by with just some simple modifications. I mentioned the importance of properly uh, selecting the insulation location of the skimmer. Uh, that dictates how much of a standing pool you'll have and how much of a stormwater storage zone you'll have. And so in this particular case, uh, the standing pool is probably a little bigger than it needs to be. And, and that skimmer could be installed lower into that outlet structure to maximize the amount of stormwater storage uh, that you could achieve. So you wanna make sure that that skimmer is installed at the appropriate depth so that you have your live storage and your dead storage consideration, your standing pool and your stormwater storage. Here's an example of a uh, skimmer outlet pipe installed right through the auxiliary spillway. And so in this case, you've got a whole lot of standing pool, but you have no, um, no stormwater storage at all. You know, that skimmer won't be dewatering until flow is basically flowing through the spillway. Um, so not a very effective installation. You want to make sure that skimmer pipe is low enough so that you have that live storage or that uh, stormwater storage volume. Here's an example where this would be a, a weir for a permanent basin, uh, but they're using it temporarily as a sediment basin. And so by leaving that weir open, uh, you have uh, a little bit of a standing pool, but you basically have no stormwater storage. You'll have water flowing through that weir um, at the same time will be flowing through the skimmer. So the skimmer is, is really not doing a whole lot. This basin itself is not gonna be detaining water for very long. Uh, but this is an easy fix. Uh, you can actually go in there and uh, add some plywood uh, or, or close off that weir, temporarily block it off so that your basin you know, serves its function. And then you can remove that plywood or that, um, that cover once you're ready to, to get into post-construction uh, application of the basin. Here's another way of connecting a skimmer. So this is, I thought this was pretty innovative where uh, maybe you just have a culvert or a temporary pipe and you haven't installed your outlet control structure yet. Uh, we're building a, a, a plywood form, a plywood box around the system and, and hooking up your skimmer. Um, you know, this is an effective way of, of creating detention around that pipe and, uh, and employing a skimmer to, to dewater from the top of the surface. And here's the example I was trying to show, having that plywood uh, in place so that you maximize your stormwater storage volume. So an easy fix that can be uh, removed once uh, that basin is ready to serve its post-construction application. I've seen a variety of uh, skimmer types being used. This is one example I pulled from a, a job site I visited in New Zealand. Um, instead of using one skimmer, they're using three different skimmers. And they've got them set up in a way where they're tiered at different elevations. Uh, so depending on how much water is in the basin, you know, that activates one or more uh, skimmer to, to dewater. Um, and so here, you know, they, they realize that higher volumes, they want to be, um, they want to be removing or dewatering faster so that they can reduce their, um, their volume back down and have storage available for the next storm event. So just another way of, of using multiple um, skimmers and having a, a stage release type of, of setup. So the Blue Book provides us with guidance on determining the appropriate skimmer flow rate. And so this, this method allows us to divide the basin volume by our desired dewatering time so that we can select a skimmer uh, that, would, that would meet our flow rate requirements. And again, you want to turn to manufacturer guidance to make sure uh, you are uh, selecting an appropriate skimmer for your needs. This is an example of what a manufacturer uh, guidance might look like for the variety of skimmer sizes they would have. Uh, but you can see how you can go in here and determine the outflow rate in cubic feet per day, and then determine the appropriate orifice and the appropriate um, um, skimmer size. So every manufacturer has their own guidance and you'd have to rely on, on what they provide uh, so that you're selecting the appropriate size. And just as a reference, you know, here's an example you can refer to. I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but it is there as a reference if you wanted to refer to uh, the slide deck that we posted. One important thing that I've seen uh, installed incorrectly on several job sites is, is what we do with that discharge that's coming from the skimmer. 
And so here's an example where that pipe that's coming out, that PVC pipe is, is dewatering a skimmer. Uh, they put some rock down, some riprap to dissipate the energy, to, to spread that flow out, which is great. Uh, but you can see the area surrounding that riprap is unprotected. And so all that water you've spent a couple days detaining and treating now um, hits this bare earth and it picks up sediment again uh, before it leaves the site. So a good idea is to take that pipe uh, directly into the receiving uh, water body or to an area that's already stabilized so that you don't have to retreat that, that water. Another example here where they're discharging within the, the boundary of the site, um, and you can see there's been a lot of sediment uh, that's accumulated around this silt fence, and so now you're discharging directly on, uh, on this clay material, and again, you're just going to resuspend that material before it leaves the site. So I thought this was an innovative uh, approach I saw on the job site. They took that uh, PVC pipe, that skimmer pipe, uh, beyond the limits of the site, so you can see they've gone through their perimeter silt fence here, uh, and they extended it out to a, a, an area that was controlled, uh, that was stabilized, that wouldn't cause additional erosion or suspension of, of soil particles. And then they came back and sealed that silt fence up by putting some expanding foam uh, so that the silt fence can still serve its purpose. So I, this seemed to be working out for them. It looked like a creative solution, and, and I liked uh, the, the creativity. Another approach that's effective for discharging skimmer water is to use a level spreader. And so this level spreader was going to be part of a, a permanent post-construction stormwater feature, uh, but during the construction phase they were using it to reduce that velocity, let it still in this area, and then you can see you know water would flow over top of this of the level spreader to an area that's stable. You get that 57 stone so that you're not scouring out um, any soil, and then you've got vegetation, you've got sod placed downstream of that, so uh, you're not picking up any uh, sediment that may be on the, the ground. Here's an example of that landing pad or that uh, dewatering pad for that skimmer. We wanna make sure that skimmer doesn't get stuck in mud. And that might prevent it from, from floating during the next storm event. Uh, so having an area where you, you keep it elevated off the, the floor of the basin is important. Uh, and having a rope attached so that you can easily from the banks, you know, move your skimmer over and unclog it or remove any debris that might be uh, slowing down flow. Another solution here to a landing pad, so this is using T-post. Uh, you drive two T-posts on the ground, you've got one going across horizontally, and now your, your skimmer has somewhere to sit. Here's an example of a skimmer being used around uh, a silt fence. And so they've created a point where water is going to be uh, impounding and uh, it's going to be detained for a period of time. Uh, and then it'll start flowing through the skim skimmer and then through their silt fence boundary. So this is kind of like a relief point in their perimeter. Uh, they realized this was a low spot, and so you, you can uh, use the skimmer in this way as well. So it's not just for basins. Well, Mike, uh, before you get into spillways, uh, you want to take a quick break? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. This might be a, a good five-minute break period for us. Yeah, so it's 10.05 right now. Uh, before we go, uh, was thinking, I guess along the way, Perry Oaks provides a, uh, it, it's not daily, but he calls it a, a daily erosion and sediment control tip or today's tip. And uh, and he's got a pretty good uh, group of folks that he's emailing those tips to now. And they're, they're good practical tips and reminders. And I'm, I'm gonna put Perry's email address in the chat box and also the, the Soil and Water Conservation Committee has a new website uh, that you may want to check out. I'm going to put those two resources in the chat box. If you're interested in receiving those tips from Perry when they come out, um, just shoot Perry an email and uh, let him know that. So, all right, 10.06, be back at 10.11. We'll get cranked back up. Thank you.
Mike, I'd say uh, crank it back up. Uh, I did put uh, Perry's email address uh, in the chat box. Just shoot him an email if you, if you want to subscribe to his erosion and sediment control tips. And also there's a new uh, website for the Alabama Water and uh, Soil and Water Conservation Committee. So you may want to check out. That's in the chat box also. All right, Mike, take it away. Thanks, Barry. So uh, the other main feature for discharging stormwater from our basins is our auxiliary spillway. And so a, a couple of important tips with the spillway, you wanna make sure you locate it on undisturbed ground rather than a prepared embankment that helps reduce the chance of failure. And you wanna make sure you properly stabilize um, the spillway with non-erosive lining, whether that's vegetation or riprap. Okay, so our spillway should be designed for a 10 year, 24 hour uh, storm event, peak flow rate. You wanna use a trapezoidal cross section with a minimum width of 10 foot and a minimum freeboard above the spillway of one foot. And that's one foot above the spillway flow. So it's important to know how deep that design flow rate is gonna be. Uh, the Alabama Handbook or the Alabama Blue Book provides design guidance for the spillway. And so I'll refer those to you if you wanna, if you wanna use them. Um, if you want to design by hand, um, you, those are, are available and are a good resource. Like I mentioned, preferred location is on undisturbed ground. Hey, Mike, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was just notified that Perry's email address is incorrect. It's P-E-R-R-Y, and I can't correct that while you're teaching. I keep changing your slides. Sorry. Okay, so here's an example of what happens if you don't have a proper spillway. Uh, water is gonna find the path of least resistance. And in this particular case, it happened to be where the barrel for the outlet control structure was. Um, and so this could have been because maybe they didn't use an anti-seat collar or maybe that embankment wasn't stable enough. Uh, but you can see what kind of breach they had on the back face of that basin. Um, just to, to zoom in on it here in the next slide, you'll see how uh, catastrophic of a, of a discharge that was. And so all that storm water and all that sediment that had been collected in that basin has, uh, you know, has breached and gone into the receiving water body. And so an anti-seep collar is something that could be used if you have large diameter pipe going through uh, the spillway or, or going through the, uh, through the basin. Uh, you probably can get away without using an anti-seep collar if it's just a four inch or a six inch PVC pipe for a skimmer. Uh, but if you do have a permanent riser structure, you certainly want to consider uh, these collars. All right, next let's talk about flocculants. So flocculants can be used to enhance the settling of soil particles in a basin. You can see here on the left-hand side, you have a sediment that does not contain flocculant. On the right-hand side, you've got flocculant that's been mixed in with the sediment. And what you're noticing is that the settling velocity is much greater for that flocculated sediment. And what we can do is we can reduce the amount of time that it takes for the soil particles to be caught um, and, and make our basin you know, more effective. Uh, increasing the velocity of, this, of the sediment uh, settlement helps us uh, capture more sediment and helps us keep that sediment at the bottom of the basin. And we can see here with this comparison, uh, the settling velocity, these are meters per second, but you can see how the velocity with flocculated sediment increases substantially compared to unflocculated sediment. Uh, also the size, the average particle diameter increases for that flocculated sediment. Uh, the surface area requirement for your basin uh, decreases, uh, which makes it you know, advantageous from a, a design standpoint. We can fit a smaller basin on the site um, you know, that's to your advantage. And this is research uh, recommendations uh, based on, on testing that's been done at uh, North Carolina State. One thing we do wanna emphasize is that flocculant should be placed far upstream uh, within your job site. Placing your flocculant within the basin is not very effective. It does help, but you do need proper agitation. You need proper uh, dissolution of that material into the stormwater. Uh, proper mixing. And so when you place flocculant on the baffle, for example, like this example is showing us, uh, this is a little bit too late for that water to get the proper mixing 
and to get that proper agitation that's required for it to be actively um, actively uh, used in the system. So place flocculant far upstream. You can place flocculant in granular form on a slope or another mechanism that's being shown here is using flock blocks. And this particular weir box uh, is acting to, to allow that water uh, to flow through this uh, structure and to come in contact with several flock blocks, which will dissolve and release flocculant into the uh, stormwater runoff. Another way you could use flocculant in the sediment basin, uh, this is kind of a, an innovative approach, but this is a, a sediment basin where uh, you're employing that shutoff valve. So you can shut that water off for the skimmer. And so now you're just permanently holding that pool of water. And what they've done is they've taken a pump and they're pumping water up from the fourth bay and they're uh, pumping it into this manifold system that you see kind of on the uh, bank of the, of the sediment basin. And that manifold, that PVC manifold has flock blocks inserted into the PVC. So now you're pumping water from the fourth bay through that manifold and back into the first bay. And you're essentially recirculating the water continuously through uh, that dosing system uh, to, to create mixing, to create agitation, to dissolve that flocculant uh, from, the, from the blocks. Uh, and so this is uh, it's, it's considered to be semi-active treatment. You still have to put that pump in there. You still have to move that water around, but it doesn't take a whole um, a stormwater treatment facility or one of those roll-off systems to treat the water. So a um, pretty inexpensive way of doing an innovative um, approach. Another shot of that manifold system. You can see here the basin is empty. But you can see how that PVC pipe is set up to receive uh, flock blocks um, in those, those T's or those Y connections. And then here's the pumping into the, the mouth of the basin back into first bay. So some tips or some takeaways to, uh, to have an ideal basin design. You wanna maximize your surface area. It's better to have lower impoundment and a larger surface area where that space is available. Reduce short circuiting so that you maximize your length to width ratio. Spread the flow out across the width of the basin. Stabilize your side slopes and your basin floor. Um, control your discharge. Um, reduce velocities so that you have no uh, erosion occurring within the basin. And then if, if needed, uh, use flocculants to enhance the, the capture of your clay and your silt uh, sized particles. Yeah, so all of those uh, points that Mike just made were, that's, that's the state of the practice for designing a sediment basin. Uh, so let's, let's move into construction now. And, and you as some of you only work in construction. So you may be handed a set of plans that someone else designed and the sediment basins, either they may not be there. Maybe you need to add some, or maybe they're there, but they don't represent the state of the practice. And so as a, as an inspector, as a contractor, as, as someone out on the, on the other side of the bid letting, uh, it's up to you now as a stormwater professional to make sure that the state of the practice is being adhered to. So let's, uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate some of the things that, that Mike has uh, already talked about, but I want you to think about it from the point of view of, of an inspector. So, so as we're doing our inspections, as we're getting ready to construct the, the brand new basin, we think uh, we focus on effectiveness and efficiency. We, we take a, an approach of do no harm and we begin with the end in mind. And uh, Peter Drucker talks about effectiveness as being getting the right things done. And he talks about efficiency as doing things right. So we have to do both of those. We have to make sure that we're focused on the right things, but also getting those things uh, done correctly. And so we want to make sure we have enough volume. We want to make sure that all the elements that, that Mike just talked about, the baffles, the, the dewatering, floating dewatering device, the uh, stabilization, all that thing, all those things are in place, partly because we don't want our sediment basin to be a source of sediment. That's the, the, the biggest waste of money you can see is to have all this stuff and, and time put into trying to polish off turbidity. And then your sediment basin is actually a, a, a source of turbidity or a source of contributing sediment to that receiving water. So we, 
stabilize the inlet, the outlet, stabilize the sides and the bottoms. Uh, we, we make sure we're capturing flocculant before or flocculated material before it reaches the, the receiving water. Uh, and then as we're, uh, as we're inspecting, as we're constructing, we're always thinking about the future. We're thinking about how's this sediment basin supposed to operate? What are those principles that cause that, that suspended sediment particle to, uh, to, to drop out of the water? What, how's this thing function? Is it functioning properly? How am I going to maintain it? Uh, and then, and then also, um, what am I going to do with this thing when construction is complete? Do we cover it up, fill it in, or do we convert it to some uh, type of permanent detention uh, facility? Uh, this this basin here was uh, a last line of defense down on one end of the the project. It drains to uh, headwaters or tributaries to Seabury Creek down there, uh, and and our designer didn't give us quite as much as we thought we needed uh, at the time we started constructing this basin. And so we, we increased the storage volume. We had some extra room within the property. And, and so we, we made it bigger and we, we adjusted it to, to limit the amount of excavation and limit the amount of, of fill it would take to create the basin. Uh, we increased the flow path. We could have put the outlet on the, uh, I guess, toward the, the top of the, the sediment basin there on your, on your screen, but we chose to put it all the way over in the corner to the right to increase the flow path. And then we put the baffles in a diagonal direction to, to get those perpendicular to the flow path. So all those things were, um, were not necessarily a part of the design, uh, but we, we made it happen just to, to increase our chances of success in the beginning or uh, as during construction. Um, a treatment train is not always a part of the, uh, the, the design. It's not always required or accepted, but are uh, uh, required or, or, or intended. But we can make that happen in the field. We, we can add, uh, add pitch checks. We can add a four bay. Uh, Eric Gotro is on the call. Yesterday we were, we were looking at a, a new project that's coming up and I, we were talking about the sensitive parts and where the water was going. And I said, well, Eric, we don't have a sediment basin to rely on. And he said, oh, yes, we do. We're going to find us an Eric hole out there somewhere. And, and so we, we do need to be thinking ahead and, and making those changes in the field. And prior to, set, prior to runoff entering a sediment basin, a four bay is... Uh, it, it makes your job easier on down the way and it also makes your sediment basin a little more effective. So here's you a, a treatment train. You can see uh, uh, protected lining, conveyances, uh, ditch checks, a four bay of sorts there. And then we've got the sediment basin beyond the, those sediment barriers and checks. The, the ditch checks up there to the right weren't necessarily a part of this treatment train. But you'll see in just a second, we, we connected two different trains to, to polish off the water. That, um, the, the turbidity in that water, it wasn't horrible, it, but it was above 50 NTU and we didn't want to discharge it. And, and so we turned this passive system into an active system. And this is looking kind of at the bottom of those ditch checks that we saw on the upper right. This is pretty clear water, about 17 or 18 NTU. And you can see some flocculent blocks there. And as that water was pumped from the, from the sediment basin over to those uh, ditch checks, we were able to, by adding an active element to that treatment train, get that water down under 50, 50 NTU. Um, so we, we certainly don't want our, our sediment basins to become a source of sediment. And, and some of the earlier photos showed geotextile uh, fabric along the sides that I think the Aldot drawings require a rolled erosion control product and seeding along the, the inner slopes of the basin. We decided on this project that, and, and from that point forward, uh, it was okay to go ahead and sod those, those side slopes. Go ahead and carry the, the sod all the way to the, the toe down there. And then even though you may end up killing some of the sod down there at the bottom, uh, you don't have to work as hard to reclaim this basin at, in the end. And this, this basin uh, will be a, uh, a permanent detention basin in the future. You can see the stabilization for the, the inlet coming in. Uh, while we're there, take a look at those ropes um, securing or, or giving you access to that, 
that scammer. I've got a story to tell you here in just a little bit. Um, so this photo, we, we got caught in a rain event before we were able to uh, get everything exactly like we wanted it, get everything stabilized. And, and while we, you know, water's dumb, we get to tell it where to go and how fast to get there. And we weren't, didn't have all that completely right uh, when the rain event came. So we had to do some adjustment, but you can see the after the rain event, we're back at work, putting sod down, uh, getting the, 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 the inlets to these two. This is a, actually a tiered basin system, which is something we can do if we've, if we've got a slope and can't get enough capacity without excavating more than we want or filling more than we want on the bottom end, we can create a, a tiered basin where the first one kind of fills up and spills over into the second one. Um, the, the valve on the end is something that I, I recommend not, not just to, to hang on to the water, but you can also adjust uh, the, the outflow as you're dewatering that basin. When you, you decide that it is time to open the valve, you can control how fast that water comes out. And if you are having scour issues, you can address it then. Um, this uh, level spreader wasn't created for the purposes of, of um, slowing down the flow of water or mitigating any scour that might be caused by our skimmer outlet, but it sure worked for us in this case. Yeah, this is the, the largest sediment basin ever constructed on an Alabama Department of Transportation project. It's up in Jefferson County. It's, it's uh, if I remember correctly, it's over 600 feet long and about 50 feet wide at, its, at the, the inner base. Um, and when it was first constructed, I couldn't wait to see it finished. And I kept calling and checking on it. And, and finally they, they said, okay, Barry, it's, it's finished. And we've got rain on the way. And so it, I was gonna get to see it in action right after the rain event uh, ended and, and drove up there and could not figure out why in the world I was seeing all this muddy water by the silt fence down there in the trees. There's a creek running through there. Uh, that we were trying to protect and all this turbid water is down there piled up at the bottom and turns out we built a fantastic looking and very expensive sediment basin but the contractor forgot to connect the plumbing that he did not cr cause water to get into the the sediment basin where we wanted it to get into and and so all that uh, all that runoff just simply bypassed the the basin and created a mess for us so so that's one thing I, I do try to drive home as we're constructing basins on construction sites is remind the contractor and the inspectors, hey, water's got to get in this thing every once in a while. So, so let's make sure we're thinking about it. Water's dumb. We, we get to tell it where to go. Uh, while we're on this photo, we actually retrofitted this sediment basin by putting the, the aggregate berm there. We created a four bay. We didn't have one in the design. So we ended up creating one at the upper end of the sediment basin. And you can see that it, uh, it gave us a place to, to capture and, and remove all that heavy sediment. So this is uh, actually that tiered basin from earlier that we, we saw. I was, I was out there last week and um, the, the, the upper basin was, was getting a little bit full. We had more rain on the way. You guys remember we had several days of rain uh, last week, this was in between some of those storms. And so we walked around and, and opened the valve on this first, uh, the basin closest to us and nothing came out. And we were scratching our heads, couldn't figure it out, wondering if the, the uh, orifice plug had been taken out. And, and, and then finally, Eric, who's on the, on the workshop with us, he realized that the, uh, that the, the skimmer had gotten flipped upside down and we didn't have a rope to uh, pull it to the side. Remember that photo earlier? And so Cowboy Cajun Eric uh, went to his truck, got a rope, and uh, we stretched it from side. I was on one side, he was on the other side of the basin, and we were able to kind of flip the basin up. And as soon as we did, it started started draining for us. And, and that got me wondering, do these other basins out here have, have access ropes? And uh, went down to the, the bottom basin to check it out. And sure enough, it does have the access ropes, you just can't get to them. So little things like that that we've got to think about, you know, there may be, that basin may get flipped upside down or it may be, maybe it was installed without the plug. We've got to be able to get to it to, to maintain it. You know, it's, it's nice to have the room to build this kind of, this size basin, but we have to remember that, that the intent of that basin is to capture sediment 
And if we don't uh, allow ourselves a place to, to get in there to, to maintain it, it's going to be difficult. So having a, a four bay either in within the basin or just outside of it is always recommended. And then having access all the way around is a pretty good idea also. And, and remember we, um, uh, that the sediment basin really is intended to polish turbidity. And if we allow that sediment basin to fill up with heavy sediment, it's, it's just not going to function to take care of turbidity also. You know, all the flocculent and the baffles and all that, they, they don't do us any good if they're buried under three feet of sediment. So as we're, as we're inspecting, don't be afraid of rain. You are a stormwater professional and you, you ought to be smiling when you see rain on the way. Although one of our inspectors says no pain or no rain, no pain. Uh, actually, it's an opportunity for us to get out there and to see how things are working. And uh, if you guys know or remember my, my late friend, Buddy Cox, uh, you wouldn't be surprised that he's the only one out there without a rain jacket. And, uh, and from those of you who work for Thompson Engineering, that's Wilson Falmer there on the right. But we can, we can learn a lot by getting out there and playing in the rain and walking around in the mud and figuring out where water's coming from, where it's going to, and how our, our practices are functioning. So um, 8M requires pre-construction and daily observations. They, they require formal inspections at least once per month and after a rain event. Um, I recommend way more frequently than once a month. And, and if, you're, if you're only going to do a formal inspection once a month, then those daily observations, they become really, really important because we need you out there looking to see what has the contractor done to, to mess up. You may have a water bar that's diverting water into the basin and the contractor's pulling the crane in, needs to get rid of the water bar. Well, they forget to put it back up sometimes and we have to be there to, to remind them. Um, the ADEM requires that we remove accumulated sediment when that uh, when the basin reaches half full. Guys, if, if your sediment basin is designed properly and it is halfway full of sediment, you're doing something wrong. There, there, that is a bad place to be and, and we need to back up and see what are we doing upstream? Do we have some kind of treatment train? Are, what have we done with the, the five pillars? You know, maybe that's the problem. We're focusing on sediment and sediment alone is simply ineffective and so we we need to once you get to a, a half the half the capacity then then we need to we should have done something way before then unless you've got a tropical storm or hurricane that makes that happen right now um so you've seen concrete risers in a lot of the photos most of those base or all of those basins with the concrete risers they were intended to become permanent detention basins in the end, and, and so we've got to be thinking toward that. And one of the reasons we went to using solid sod on the side slopes instead of filter fabric is it's really difficult to get this filter fabric up at the end and then reestablish vegetation. You pretty much have to start from scratch. Uh, so thinking about the end is, is pretty important. Here's a, a small basin used in a residential setting that, uh, it's, it's working just fine. It's still working. Uh, as the project comes to a completion, they were able to, to start getting their plantings in. And you can leave the baffles in and the skimmer in till the very end. You can leave that in even, even after the project accepted if the owner is willing to come back and take those out a little bit later. So um, that's construction, maintenance, and, and retrofitting. And I'll turn it back over to Mike. Thanks, Barry. And we wanted to take a, a few slides here to kind of show you some emerging technologies or some really innovative approaches we've seen with sediment basins. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that, that New Zealand job site I got to visit. And New Zealand cares a lot about their natural environment and they have very strict stormwater regulations. If you think things are strict here, you should go down there where they basically can't discharge any water from a job site until it's flown through a sediment basin. Um, and so this particular, uh, this last slide was just showing you how they've laid out their basins throughout the site so that any water that's, that's flowing away from the site is being treated before it leaves. Um, and these, you know, these pictures here show you examples of what their basin looks like. Uh, they're very different than ours. You don't see any baffles, uh, but what they do is they actually construct an area where their inflow channel is in 
uh, and they call that that's a level spreader. Uh, but what they do is they control the velocity coming in by spreading out the flow across the entire width of the basin. So they're still achieving the same idea as a baffle. They're slowing that velocity down, reducing resuspension, and they're also providing a four bay by having that level spreader. That block pipe you see going across, that's just there to prevent any floating debris from getting to the skimmers that are in the back of the basin. Uh, another really cool thing that I saw while, while I was there was their approach for dosing uh, flocculant into their basin. So they rely a lot on flocculant use and uh, the method they use is called the flock shed. And so this is basically a, a plywood constructed shed. It might be four foot by four foot um, and maybe eight foot high, but the system is designed to collect rainfall on the roof of the shed. That rainfall gets um, uh, drips, drips into that blue tank, they call it the header tank on top. And then as that water fills that tank, it starts to flow into that white tank you see. And uh, that white tank becomes heavier and it pushes down into the black drum, that black tank, which contains their flocculant, it's a liquid flocculant. And so that, that white tank is displacing the fluid, the, the flocculant out of the black tank. And then it gets, um, you know, it discharges into the inflow channel of the basin. So I thought that was super innovative, you know, real easy way of, of dosing the flocculant based on the amount of rainfall you've had. And so there's a, some math and there's some calculation that's gone into the size of the roof uh, to make sure that you're dosing the appropriate amount of flocculant based on the rainfall and the contributing area of the site. And you can see here for large basins, they use uh, multiple flock sheds um, and you can see how they're, they're dripping right into the inflow channel of the basin. And those turquoise colored drums, that's where their flocculant comes in. That's how they get shipped out to the site. Um, they come in those 55 gallon drums and the, they have a, a subcontractor that comes and replaces them. So they just, you see them sitting all around the site. Um, and this was a, a manufactured product, the same idea. It has that white roof that collects the, the rainfall and then it's dosing flocculant into a, a sediment basin. Same idea, it's just a little different. Uh, they also are required to do active monitoring. So they, they have turbidity monitors within their basin and then downstream of the basin uh, so that they can monitor how effective the basin is working from a turbidity standpoint. Uh, you can see visually, they're doing a, a really good job. You can, that water's pretty clear. It's about as clear as you can get. Uh, but I wanted to see some of the data and I was fortunate to have the data shared with me and you can see here on the y-axis, uh, you've got your turbidity. And then on your x-axis, you have uh, time. So this was a storm event that came in. You can kind of see on the top of the, of the graph in blue, that's the depth of rainfall they had. Uh, but this red line shows you the inflow turbidity. And their turbidity meters max out at 10,000 NTU. So this was at the limit that they were able to read. But if you look at the discharge through their basin, they're doing a really good job of keeping that turbidity super low on their, on their discharge. And this is in log scale to try to make it a little bit more easier to read, uh, but you can see they're getting substantial amount of reduction in NTU in the turbidity before, before discharge. So this is looking at efficiency. You can see almost 100% efficiency at some points throughout that time. So really cool system. We've also been playing around here at Auburn with lamella settlers, and you may have seen some of this if you've come out to our, our uh, field days, uh, but we've got these tanks set up where we're trying to reduce the settling distance that those soil particles have to fall out before they're captured in a basin. And so we've tested these, these tanks out. We're still trying to optimize how to you know, use them on, a, on an actual construction site, uh, but we've shown that they actually they do help. We just have to make it a little bit more practical. Uh, but the idea is to reduce the height by having these parallel plates uh, capturing those soil particles within this tank and then discharging uh, water that's, that's less turbid. And you can see a photo here of some of our large scale testing that we've done. Um, we've also looked at installing these lamella settlers downstream of the skimmer. So this pipe that you see sticking out of the, the berm, that's, a, that's your skimmer discharge and it's flowing directly into this, um, this lamella settler box. Just to show you some ideas of, the, of how it's built, but we're thinking of something that might be portable. You can take it from job site to job site, uh, detain that water in there. And this is just some data to show you how you can attenuate your discharge when it's going through that box. And then also, you know, you can add flocculant to it and, and really polish that, 
storm water uh, before it, it discharges. Uh, you can see here, this is just an idea showing you the reduction in turbidity we've been able to achieve with this system. So we've uh, developed a design example, uh, but rather than getting into details on the design, I wanna leave this as a reference. Uh, I, I realize most of you are not designing sediment basins. Um, and if you are, you're probably not doing it by hand. Um, so this, these examples that we put together, they, they do take you a step-by-step -step process. Um, but you know, another resource we've posted on the website is, is SedSpread, which is a, a sediment basin design tool that uses the Alabama Blue Book guidance. It uses Outdoc guidance, and you can design a basin using that automated tool as well. And so Barry, I'd like to skip over this section just in the interest of time. And let's get into just showing some examples of how we can improve some common basin deficiencies that I've seen on job sites. And so uh, this is a sediment basin that was installed uh, out in front of a big box store here in, in Auburn. Uh, but there was a few things that you know, weren't done as effectively as they could have been to make sure the basin is performing at its intended, um, in its intended function. But you, know, you wanna make sure your channel is properly armored, that your basin is stabilized so that it's not causing erosion, that your baffles get extended all the way up the side uh, slopes of the basin. Um, you know, your skimmer needs to be placed in the fourth bay. You wanna maximize the flow length of water coming in, uh, stabilize around the perimeter of the site. If you do have, your, when you have your spillway, don't cross the spillway with silt fence because that silt fence is gonna fail. Um, another example here where uh, this was at our, our new high school being built, uh, but think about the placement of the spillway. You know, you don't wanna, you don't want water that's gonna flow through the spillway to make it onto a, a road that has a lot of vehicle traffic because that could create a flooding situation that could uh, put people in harm's way. Stabilize that basin, uh, don't intersect channels with silt fence, uh, and locate away from areas that could have flooding uh, concerns. Here's a basin that didn't have an inflow channel. You know, the idea was that it was going to have sheet flow coming into the basin, and that's the way the plans had shown it, so it was built to the plans, uh, but there was little thought uh, put in to how flow was actually going to work uh, coming in. And so you know, stabilize that basin, uh, make sure the baffles are perpendicular to the flow direction. So if you do have uh, sheet flow coming in, you know, in this particular setup, it's coming in parallel to the baffles. So the baffles aren't really slowing that water down. And then the skimmer, you want it to be as far away as possible from uh, the inflow. And so here the, the improvement would have been to add a berm, you know, add a channel coming into the basin, uh, into the first bay of the basin. Um, and just create a diversion for that to, to occur correctly. And you can see the same basin during a storm event. Uh, they ended up having short circuiting that, that sheet flow doesn't stay sheet flow for very long. It starts to become shallow concentrated and eventually concentrated. And you can see it's coming in at the worst possible place within the basin, right in front of that skimmer where the distance between inflow and outflow is very short and you're not stealing that water. You're not slowing it down through the baffles. And like I said, this was designed that way. You can see in the plans here that the skimmer's in the right spot, the baffles are in the right spot per the design. And so there just needs to be a little bit more thought put into uh, what the, the basin design should look like at the design stage. Um, and this is where tools like SedSpread and other worksheets could help you uh, properly size and, and place uh, the, uh, the uh, sediment basin. Again, discharge, extend that discharge pipe into the receiving water body or into at least a stable area. So let's talk about what makes that perfect sediment basin. What, what components do we need to make sure we're including and, and you know, tips that, that we need to consider? Adequate volume is important. You know, make sure you're meeting your design volume so that you're, you're detaining that water long enough for that settlement to occur. Um, stabilize around the basin, stabilize within the basin, stabilize upstream of the basin so that your basin doesn't become a source of the problem. It doesn't create additional uh, soil loss and, and erosion. Use baffles, make sure they're installed correctly at the right height, make sure they're secured to the basin floor, secured to the basin sidewalls. Uh, use flocculant if it's appropriate for your site to maximize the effectiveness of silt and clay-sized soil particle capture. 
use surface dewatering to make sure you've got the appropriate sized skimmer for your desired detention time and that you're, you've got means of maintaining it, you know, either using a rope or, or using other means for, to keep it out of the mud or, or um, all those different tips we've, we've talked about today. And realize that your sediment basins, they can be very effective, they can be highly effective if they're designed and constructed, maintained uh, properly. And so with that, Barry, I think we're at a good spot to do our, um, our, our poll questions and uh, leave some time for, for Q&A. Awesome. Yeah, you guys have been waiting for this moment for three workshops now that we would leave you enough time to, for discussion at the end. So we're about there. And so I guess we can uh, quickly summarize our learning objectives again. We want you to be able to explain the function and role of a basin, describe the state of the practice, and then apply your learned principles towards design and implementation of a basin. So let's start off with our, our poly V quiz. So jump back on the poly V. And our first question is, at a minimum, a sediment basin should be designed to store the following amount of runoff. And I'm saying most of you are saying 3,600 cubic feet per acre, and that is correct. That's the guidance from the blue book. Um, I put in the trick question there, the 95th percentile storm event, that's post-construction. So that's when you're looking at water quality from post-construction. So that was there to throw you off. And then the answer of one inch of runoff per acre, that is also correct because that is equivalent to 3,600 cubic feet per acre. So good job for those of you that picked up on that. Did I skip one? No, okay. So at a minimum, sediment basins should have the following length to width ratio. So this is looking at the top length and top width of the basin. What, what length to width ratio do we want? Two to one, absolutely. It looks like all of you are getting that correct. Okay. When it comes to flocculants, flocculants should be applied upstream of the sediment basin to encourage mixing, agitation, and proper contact time. Yep, and the majority of you are, are getting that correct. We want to place our flocculant and dose our flocculant way upstream of the basin, let it come into good contact with our stormwater, you know, place it at your stormwater inlets, place it behind ditch checks, um, and make sure it's properly mixed before it gets into the basin. So now we've got some more um, general questions on the overall workshops that we've we presented here, but uh, the number one cause of impairment of Alabama rivers and streams, is it poorly maintained construction sites, sedimentation, siltation, pathogens, or lack of species diversity? And it's, it is sedimentation and siltation, and there are a variety of sources for sedimentation. Um, poorly maintained construction sites is one source, uh, but there's also a lot of agriculture, forestry, and other land disturbing activities that occur in the state that lead to sediment and siltation um, reaching our streams. Yeah, even some uh, non-land disturbance related activities. So just simply developing a watershed without managing post-construction stormwater flow can increase the the runoff rates and cause bed and bank movement of streams, which also creates sediment and siltation. All right, Mobile and Baldwin counties have additional regulatory requirements for managing stormwater. And that is true. And so Barry, that falls into the coastal zone and, and remind me of the rest of the act. Coastal, Coastal Zone Amendment Reauthorization Act, CZARA, something like that. SARZA? Yeah. Okay, and then last question, the five pillars of construction stormwater management, which are managing communication, work, water, erosion, and then managing sediment, are listed in order of is it priority, effectiveness, economics, 
or is it all of the above? Yep, that's that's right. So I I know I, Mike, my poll EV was dragging. I know some of you may have have had some issues with poll EV during that time also. But I hope hope you got the point there that uh, we were trying to trying to ask some questions to remind you uh, to kind of uh, recap sediment basin design and but also uh, look back over the the entire workshop series. Uh, the last three questions there. So. Um, Mike Shelton, do we have any questions in the chat or or does anyone, uh, I guess if you have questions, go ahead and plug those into the chat if you can. Or even just, just discussion, comments. We'd love to hear hear your thoughts. Yeah, at this moment, we, uh, we don't uh, have any questions. Y'all must have done such a great job of, uh, of explaining the thing that uh, we don't uh, have any questions. There, uh, again, um, you know, I think the, uh, some of the innovative things that were, were shown here, uh, um, you know, they, have, they certainly have opportunities for, uh, for Mike and the folks at, uh, at Auburn to, to flesh out some of their uses here in the U.S. And uh, it's very important that we, that we try to take advantage of, of uh, this, this growing science that's around, uh, around the, this erosion uh, management and uh, erosion and sediment management. And so uh, th these are good opportunities. I, I do encourage folks to, to uh, you know, take advantage of the trade information that's out there and also what gets published out of, uh, out of, the, out of Mike's group as, as well as what you will see and hear at uh, uh, all of the Clearwater Alabama meetings that, uh, and conferences and field days that are out there. And hopefully through, uh, through what, we've been, what Laura and I've been doing here that uh, we can get this information out. And uh, that does uh, lead me to uh, having you fill out that uh, evaluation because we do have a place on uh, the evaluation form for you, the audience to make suggestions. And I'm just about to post that uh, link up here for the final evaluation for this uh, for this class. And so that's up there now. And if you can take a minute to complete that, that'd be great. And uh, once again, I appreciate Laura's help in putting these on and, and also want to uh, thank uh, Mike and Barry for, uh, for a great program, uh, for great three programs and uh, hopefully we can keep going with this and um, and outside of that um, uh, I'll turn it back over to you guys and to to just to give that uh, any uh, any final wrap up from the from the uh, webinar itself. Yep. Chuck uh, I saw your video pop up did you have a question? And you're muted by the way. So there there was a comment that was made by Perry uh, when I on this slide here, you know, we were talking about uh, creating a temporary connection for a skimmer. Um, and Perry noted that if this is not properly anchored, you know, the box could become buoyant and you could have a, a pretty nasty setup. So when you do something like this, you wanna make sure you're properly monitoring it and making sure it's working the way it was designed. So I just wanted to highlight that before we, we ended. Yeah, and I, I actually took that photo, not one of my jobs, but a place that I was hanging out with my dog at the time. Um, and Perry, there was an issue with buoyancy because the plywood was so uh, not sealed that uh, the, the water ran up in, in within, uh, within the box at the same rate it did outside of the box. But I, I think it did slow water down and, and it did force some water through the, the skimmer. And it, I guess it kind of served as a, a controlled outlet device itself. But thank you, Mike, for that. Yeah, the only thing, the only question I had was about flocculants. Did uh, we introduce the flocculants before before the the uh, the sediment basin? Uh, I guess that's the best way to do it. I guess you're using the flock clogs instead of maybe the jute netting. 
Well, if, if you can introduce it in between the forebay and the sediment basin, typically on the, on the inlet in going into the sediment basin is a great place to put it because you can get some agitation there, some mixing, and then you've got the settling time. The thing about flocculants is it, if you overload the flocculant with sediment, then it, that flocculant just, it, it's attracted to the sediment. Uh, itself and and so you can lose the effectiveness really quickly, especially with a flock block. It can it can become coated with sediment and and rendered uh, useless pretty quickly. So get the heavy sediment out of the way, and then uh, use flocculant only to polish off turbidity. Mike Perez, do you have something else to add? Yeah. No, that's great. Remember soil specific. So you want to do some jar testing before you select the the flocculant type, and um, and manufacturers do help you with selecting. The, the amount of flocculant you need to add based on expected flow rates and, and placement. So. All right, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you again for, uh, for spending time with us, investing in your, uh, your knowledge. And, and remember, there's a, a gap between knowing and doing that we, we have an obligation to narrow at every opportunity. So don't don't just store all this information up in your brain. It's time to apply it. And even better than that, teach it to somebody else. As, as you apply it, you'll learn different things. And, and uh, as stormwater professionals, we need to be uh, sharing that information with as many people as we can. So thank you, Mike Perez. Thank you, Mike Shelton. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's been a, a good workshop series for me personally. I appreciate it. So we'll uh, see you guys next time. <laughs> yeah, here I'm, I'm talking into a muted microphone again. So yeah, thank you guys and uh, thank everybody for attending and uh, just another nudge regarding that evaluation. Please, uh, please do that. And, and uh, now that I have your email addresses, uh, you'll, you'll be receiving information in the future regarding uh, other programs. Again, thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, gentlemen. You're welcome.